So we're making our way through the fascinating book of 1 Corinthians. It's a personal letter that God inspired the Apostle Paul to write to the church, to the Christians in Corinth, and they had sent him a letter and were asking all these questions. Well, now that we're a Christian, what do we do in this situation? And so throughout this book, he's answering their questions. And in this particular passage, he answers a lot of them. And while those might not be the exact questions that we would ask, the answers do give us some insight into how we are to live our lives as new creations in Christ Jesus. Now, we're looking at 24 verses, so my normal pattern is to read the text and then unpack it. But since there's so many verses, I'm just going to start, and we're going to get the question, and the question is based upon what's in the text, and then the text answers the question. So get out your message notes, let's go along, and let's enjoy learning the word of the Lord this morning. Question one, now that I'm a Christian, if I'm a man, should I get circumcised or uncircumcised? At that time, they had learned to do both. And so is there something that God wanted them to take care of now that they were saved? And so Paul answers their question. Verse 17, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. Now you're going to see that word called throughout the text. And if it helps you put the word called, put the word saved. So when God called you, when God saved you, that's what he means. So that'll help you to understand. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call, of his salvation, already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. So if you're a circumcised Jew, that's fine, don't change anything. If you're an uncircumcised Gentile, that's also fine, don't change anything. Verse 19, because neither of those things count for anything. That word count, to comply with what God wants. So changing your body and cutting your body or our body or fixing it isn't the issue. What is the issue? Keeping the commandments of God. That's consistent with what Jesus taught in the Great Commission when he said, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. So what would that mean practically for us as believers? I don't think we're asking questions about circumcision But we do want to understand, so the issue is keeping the commandments of God. What does that mean? And so let's just unpack that. Keeping means knowing, watching, observing. And the commandments of God are what God has said, what God has revealed in his word. And so we begin with a foundational lesson, which is we need to learn the word of God. If I'm going to obey the Lord, I have to know what he said, And what he has said is found recorded in the Bible, God's holy word. So that's why you have a Bible. That's why you read it every day. And that's why you learn what God has said, what Jesus taught. You become a student of the word. That would be one application to the answer to Paul, that Paul gave. Then the word keeping also means obeying and following. So that would be another lesson. We need to obey the word of God. That is, we put it into practice. We live it. We order our lives after it. I mean, let's face it. If you claim to be a Christian, but you don't talk like one and act like one, the logical conclusion is you're probably not a Christian. Because if you know it, but you don't live it, there's a disconnect there. And so we all get that, don't we? I mean, you know people that talk the Christian life, but then they don't live it, and you yourself would say, well, that's hypocritical. You're just going through a role, playing a role, but you don't really live it. So we put it into action. Here's the way James wrote it in James 1, 22 through 25. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You're just deceiving yourself if you think you can know it but don't do it. 
He says, for anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, it's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So you're a Christian, you look into the word of God and it gives you glimpses of who you are in Christ as a new creation and how you're to live. And so you do that. But if you walk away and you forget it and you don't do it, the one who looks intently into the perfect law of liberty and perseveres being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, watch this, watch it, he will be blessed in his doing. And so the idea, it's not just enough to know it. We are to do it, to become like Christ. So what counts? What complies with what God wants is not altering your physical body, but it's letting the word of God alter you so that you become a genuine Christian a godly man, a virtuous woman, by the words, the ways that you live your life. That's what counts. That's what complies with God. And that's the message that Paul was getting across. Get it? Good. Question two. Should a Christian bondservant leave his master? Now, we know that, that we don't have that question today, but they did because many of them had become bondservants. So at that point, remember, all the questions don't apply to everyone. For example, that first question applied to men, but there was a larger application that applied to us all here. So if bondservants, they were like, okay, so I got saved. I mean, before I got saved, I was a slave to a master. I served my time. I was done, but then he treated me so well, I wanted to be his bondservant. So I entered back under his authority. He's my master. I'm his bondservant. We bound, we're bound for life. We agreed together in that commitment. But now I'm a Christian. God saved me. Jesus is now my master and Lord. So am I done with my master? I mean, I know I made a commitment to him, but do I fulfill that? Or do I, can I just leave and walk away? And so that's what he's going to answer. Verse 21. Were you a bondservant when you were called, there's that word again, saved, do not be concerned about it, meaning don't renege on your commitment to your master. Keep serving him. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. So you're a bondservant. If you want to go to your master and make an appeal that you be released from that commitment, you can do that. And if he releases you, you go on your way. You're free. But if he doesn't release you from the commitment, you need to be a man of your word and you need to stay under your master's authority. He says in 22, for he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. So even though you're someone's bondservant, you are free in the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. So the Lord set you free from the law of sin and death. You're now bound to him. He's a wonderful master. Verse 23, you were bought with a price. You were purchased. You were redeemed. So do not, now here's a directive, do not become bondservants of men. So when you're a slave, you've got a master, and your time of service has completed, don't become his bondservant. Live as a free man in Christ. 24, so brothers, in whatever condition each was called, saved, there let him remain with God. And so that's pretty clear. He answered their question. But there is uh, one point that I think is worth mentioning that applies to all of us, and that's this. Become a person whose word can be trusted. I mean, think about it. If God saves you, and then you go and renege on all the commitments that you've made, all the promises that you've made. Well, now that I'm a Christian, I don't keep my promises. Now that I'm a Christian, I'm not going to agree to that contract. I'm not going to fulfill the commitments that I agreed to do. I'm not going to follow the vow I made. <laughs> Who's going to respect you as a Christian? So you, you get saved and now you're free just to renege on everything you committed before you were saved? That's not what he's teaching at all. We need to be people of our word. If we say we're going to do something, we need to do it. 
If we made a promise, we need to keep it. If we signed a contract, we need to fulfill it. Uh, One of the illustrations that we have is with Onesimus. And Onesimus uh, was a slave. He wasn't a bondservant, but he was a slave of Philemon, who was a believer. And, uh, And he wanted his freedom, Uh, But he didn't wait until his time of service was over, so he just ran away. And he ends up in Rome. He hears the gospel of Jesus Christ, and God saves him. And so then Paul counsels him, okay, now that you're saved, you need to go back to your master Philemon and fulfill the obligation that you agreed to do. And so the book of Philemon is Paul's letter to the Christian Philemon saying, hey, Uh, receive Onesimus as a brother in Christ. I can't tell you how to treat him. Maybe you need to discipline him for running away. But the reality is he's a brother in Christ, so receive him. And that's the letter that he sends to Philemon. Uh, But uh, it's interesting that Onesimus was sent back to fulfill the commitment that he owed. Paul wrote, put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. And so you and I, as Christians, we become people of our word. We can be trusted. What we say we will do, we will do. Question three, now that I'm a Christian, should I divorce my unbelieving spouse? So let's say I was a man, I got saved, but I'm married to a woman and she didn't get saved. She doesn't embrace Christ as Lord and Savior. So since I'm saved, she's not, should I divorce her and send her away? That's the question he's going to answer. 25. Now concerning the betrothed. Now since we don't use that word, I gave you what it meant there in parentheses to an unmarried person. I have no command from the Lord. Meaning nothing recorded in scripture yet speaks specifically to this issue. He says, but 25, I give my judgments as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy I think that in view of the present distress, I gave you that definition of distress, pressure from external circumstances, it's good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound, that word means knit, married to a wife, then don't seek to be free. So the answer is clear, no. You do not divorce an unbelieving spouse. If they are willing to remain married to you, you remain married to them. Why would that be? Well, we we talked about that last week. Look at verse 16. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And so the idea that when you're married to someone who's not a believer, they see a living Christian being transformed right before them. What a great witness, what a great testimony to the gospel and the power of God to change lives. And so why would you try and get away from this person? Let them see you grow in your faith. And so I put that down as commentary. Lead unbelievers to Christ. Don't cut them off. Uh, If someone's an unbeliever, uh, we want them in our lives unless it's unhealthy to do so. We have to draw a boundary or whatever. But your goal shouldn't be to get away from unbelievers, but to live the gospel before them with the hopes that it will lead them to faith in Christ. Question four. Now that I'm a Christian, should I pursue marriage? And the answer to the question now is going to get quite involved So let's begin. Verse 27, are you free from a wife? That is, are you unmarried? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed, an unmarried woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. We'll define that. And I would spare you that. So the idea is, It's not wrong to marry, but if you are not married, don't seek marriage. Ultimately, you seek or you pursue the Lord. So I put that down for commentary. You and I, our ultimate goal in life is not to get married. Our ultimate goal in life is to pursue the Lord. That becomes paramount above everything else, and that's what he's teaching. You seek the Lord. If God guides you to a mate and marriage, enjoy marriage. If God gives you grace to remain single, be content with that. 
And then Paul gives uh, the reason why he says, do not seek a wife. Do not pursue that because when you get married, you will have worldly troubles. Worldly is the word for flesh of this world. And troubles is the word pressures, stress, burdens, anguish. Paul is not discounting the value and beauty and sanctity of marriage and family. But he is acknowledging that when you get married and you unite your life with another, life can get more dynamic. There can be more things that are involved in life, and those things can distract you and even burden you from the ministry. You have to remember, Paul's passion is ministry in the kingdom, serving the Lord. And whatever you can do to stay focused on that, that should be the highest priority in your life. And so put that down, pursue serving the Lord. I mean, you you can't read this whole text. If you read it over and over again, as many of your teachers did this morning as they were preparing the lesson, you notice Paul's priority and passion for serving the Lord. Now, he was gifted to forego marriage and sexuality so he could give himself fully to serving the Lord. And so, but he gives that counsel uh, with that in mind that you pursue the Lord and he will give you grace uh, to do whatever he's called you to do. Um, It's interesting. um, So uh, Shirley started getting all our taxes together last week, all our information. And it was just a reminder, do you realize how complicated it is to live in this wonderful land? I mean, it's just daunting, all the things to keep track of. Uh, We've been watching a couple of uh, shows, Mindless, whatever, and it talks about um, um, being minimalist and living simply. And I've just been kind of processing that through, you know, in our generation, if you're older like I am, and, you know, you were, uh, you, when you have a house, you put a picture on every wall, and you put a plant in every corner, and your life is full, your house is full of stuff. And now, it's like minimalism. You go in, and the style is very clean, very simple, hardly anything on the walls, hardly anything on the tables, not much furniture, very simple. And I'll tell you, I look at that, and I think, well, first of all, that's weird, because I'm, I'm used to kind of seeing everything decorated up, but I think, wow, that must be so simple to take care of. And I think of how complicated it is to take care of our house, and I went, Okay, there is a benefit to living simply. And I think that's the heart of what Paul is trying to say. Listen, um, try and live as simply. You know, he who dies with the most toys wins. No, he who dies with the most toys dies exhausted because it just, it's so much to take care of. You know, when Shirley was going through her dream phase, and my wife's the dreamer in our relationship. I'm a real practical, just tell me how to get it. I want to get it done. She's the dreamer and has all kinds of ideas, and I've learned let her dream. It doesn't mean I have to figure out how to do it, and if I start figuring out how to do it, it upsets her. No, no, I'm just dreaming. Oh, yeah, that means shut up. Okay, listen, and just affirm, oh, you know, and... um, we're gonna, well, let's get an RV when you tr- retire, and let's travel the world. And I said, honey, I don't want one more thing to take care of. I don't even want to mow my lawn. You know, I, <laughs> I, want, I just want less and less to take care of. I simplify, clean out. I just, I, a simple life has become very desirable for us. And, um, and so I think that's a little bit of what Paul is tapping into. Just be careful getting so caught up with so much things that you have to take care of that you don't notice your neighbor across the street that needs the Lord or ministry opportunities that are before you because you're consumed taking care of so many things. And that application has to work in each of our own hearts. I won't tell you how to live your life. Don't worry. 29, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. The appointed time is a reference to the second coming of Christ, something that Jesus continually referred to. And so I put that down as one of our lessons. We're to live as if the Lord could return at every moment, at any moment. I mean, he could return today. Would that be okay? I mean, if the trumpet sounded and Jesus came back, would that be okay? I think it would. And, uh, and so it's the idea of being careful with commitments you make, things you pursue, and getting so involved that you forget the reality is that the Lord could come back at any moment, and when he does, everything changes. He comes back to rule all the things you're having. To... Done. Done. This life is over. And uh, really, only what's done for Christ lasts. Uh, we learned last week, even marriage and sexuality is not eternal. It's not in heaven. 
And so we make the most and we treasure the gifts that God gives us, but we don't become so consumed with them that we forget to serve the Lord and fulfill the ministries that he's given us. Uh, Look down at 39. For this present form, the present form of this world is passing away. So things are passing away and we need to accept that. What Paul's going to do next is give a litany of statements that basically reinforces what I just said, but he says it in a way that I would never say it. I mean, I've read it several times and I just went, I don't think I would say it that way, but I wasn't his audience. He was writing to his audience and they understood in the context what he was saying. And so he was basically saying, live simply, live carefully in such a way that you're not so entrenched with the things of this world that you can't have a mind always focused on the kingdom and the ministries that God has given you. That's a good caution. I I, I buy that. 29, from now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. Let those who mourn as though they were not mourning. Those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. Those who buy as though they had no goods. Those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. So the message is here. Don't become so encumbered that you don't anticipate the Lord's return and fulfill the ministries that he's given you. Next, Paul's going to explain why he encourages people to remain single, and he's just building his case. Uh, Verse uh, 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. Now, when I read that word anxiety, I thought, is that that sinful? But the, the Greek word there, and I think I put it in parentheses, isn't sinful. It depends on the context. It just means you have careful thought of. Okay, so he's not talking about a sinful action here. He says, the unmarried man is anxious. He takes careful thought about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. Verse 35 is the key. If you don't remember anything, just remember 35, circle it, underline it, yellow, highlight it. It really, think, is the essence of what Paul is saying. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint on you. He's not putting us under the law, trying to give us directives about how to live our lives, but to promote good order, just a sense of orderliness about your life as opposed to being chaos and out of control, and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. That's what he's saying. And so if you get that message, I think you'll get the essence of this. Uh, As I read that, I went, okay, so that's really what he's teaching. It's just stay undividedly devoted to the Lord. That's a good word for us all. Uh, The lesson, um, I believe, needs to be put down. Singleness has advantages in ministry. So be careful exalting marriage and dismissing singlehood. We, We honor both depending on how people have been called, which then leads to question number five. So as a parent, should I require my children to get married? Now, the reason he's saying that is because arranged marriages were very common in that day. And so they're saying, okay, well, I'm saved now. Do we, do we still do the arranged marriage things like they did in my other religion? Or do I arrange a marriage for my child? Or do I require my child to remain single? What do I do here? He gives the answer. 36. If anyone, that's any parent, thinks that he's not behaving properly toward his betrothed, That's his unmarried child. That is, your child's passions are strong. It has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It's no sin. So you're watching your child. You're not just parenting every child the same. Every child's different. So as a parent, you study your children. And you learn what they need. You learn their unique bents and callings from God. And you direct them in that way. That's kind of what he's saying. What we as Christian parents do. So we direct them in the way we believe. So I'm not going to arrange a marriage when they're young because I don't really know what my child wants yet. I don't really know what God might be calling him to do. So he's basically saying, don't arrange a marriage. Watch your child. And then direct your child either toward marriage or toward singlehood, depending on how God has gifted him. That's what he's saying. Let me read it. Uh, Let me finish reading. 37, whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, 
and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So keep your child if they don't feel called to marriage and then keep their desires under control. So then he who marries his betrothed, gives his child in marriage, does well. But notice, he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Interesting. So again, he's giving this um, support for singlehood. So anyone's the father or mother, betrothed is of marrying age. You discern what your child needs and you direct them accordingly. And I think there's an underlying principle that's good for us all. You learn to discern the needs of, of others, starting with your mate, your children, whatever God has called you to do, there is this sense of just being sensitive and discerning to what is best, God's best for a child, for a person, and direct them accordingly. That's how we as Christians live. There is this wisdom and discernment that God imparts along the journey, and we learn to appreciate that. Question number six, now that I'm a Christian, what about divorce? Okay, that takes a book to answer, and I'm going to take 30 seconds, and we're going to move on. Okay, that's a whole other message. But 39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. So the idea that divorce should not be pursued unless the situation is dire, and Jesus does give those directives. And uh, you, if you're going to develop a systematic theology about divorce and remarriage, you look at all the passages, not just this one. There are many that help to form what we as Christians believe. Question seven, as a Christian, what about widows? What if if your mate dies? And what about remarriage? And so he says, but if her husband dies, she's free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Really? Well, there's another passage. A widow is free to marry a Christian. And then interesting, he would give that directive. So if you become a Christian, you should not be marrying a non-Christian. If you are a Christian, you marry a Christian. And in his second letter, in 2 Corinthians 6, Paul will clarify how important it is that we be yoked with believers, and not just a believer, but a growing believer, how important that principle is. And then Paul kind of finishes in verse 40, 40 just by kind of pulling it all together and say, yet in my judgment, she is, watch this, happier. And I thought, well, what is that word? In the Greek, it means supremely blessed, fortunate, well off, if she remains single, a widow as she is, and I think that I too have the spirit of God. And so I thought there was one lesson that was very important for us all. Don't view married Christians as more fortunate than single Christians. Because Paul has just given the case that if God has called someone to singlehood, they will be blessed in being single and not be encumbered with some of the things that marrieds have to deal with. And so it's a good, good responses, good applications for us to consider. But I will tell you this, I think there's also one judgment that we have to be care of in the church. If you ever meet an older single I have found that there is a temptation to judge them, or I've heard it, and just to say, like, what is wrong with them? Why are they not married? As if something's wrong with them. Well, maybe they're not married because God has given them the gift of celibacy, and God has called them to serve the Lord. And in doing that, they are very fortunate. They are very well off. They are very blessed. So let's make sure we have a balanced perspective on this truth. So I'm just going to take a moment now. I'm just going to read the lessons through, and then we'll be done, and then we'll have communion, all right? So just listen to these lessons, consider what the Lord would say to you, and then we'll be done. We need to learn the word of the Lord. And not only learn it, we need to obey the word of the Lord, putting it into practice. We need to become a person whose word can be trusted. If we have said we will do something, we will follow through. As far as unbelievers, we go, our goal is to lead them to Christ, not cut them off. And so we want to be sensitive to those who don't know Christ. We want to pursue knowing the Lord, and we want to pursue serving the Lord. That becomes our pursuit more than marriage or singlehood or whatever. Ultimately, we pursue the Lord, and then He directs our lives and deals with all these other things. We live as if the Lord could return today, We remember that singlehood has advantages in ministry. We learn to discern the needs of others. A widow is free to marry a Christian. 
But don't view married Christians as more fortunate than singles. Wisdom from above. Thank the Lord. Let's pray.